By this point in his ministry, it was clear that Jesus' teachings would be unlike what the people of his time were used to hearing. The poor will receive the kingdom of God? The meek will inherit the earth? Blessed are the persecuted? The scribes and the Pharisees were not teaching such things, and yet those who truly understood God's law recognized the truth in the Savior's words. An eye for an eye and hate thine enemy were lesser laws. But Jesus Christ had come to teach a higher law, designed to help us one day become perfect, even as our Father which is in heaven is perfect. Hi everyone, this is the Hope in Christ podcast, and I'm Ben Peterson, a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Meant as a companion to the Come Follow Me resources that are produced by the church, this podcast is meant to help you study, understand, and love the scriptures and teachings of God's prophets, and increase your faith and hope in Christ as you help prepare yourself, your family, and others for His return. I'm glad you're listening today and hope you enjoy and share these scripture highlights. Hi, today's scripture highlight comes from Matthew chapter 5 and from Luke chapter 6. Matthew chapter 5 begins in Matthew chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. In those last two verses of chapter 24, we read about people following Jesus and crowding to hear what he had to say. And in chapter 5, we learn that the Savior goes up into a mountain, and with his disciples, he begins to teach them. Now, this is in the area of Galilee, near the city of Capernaum. This is after he has called his disciples, his apostles, and he's going to teach not only his apostles and train them up to become great leaders of the church, but he's also teaching other disciples who are there. Now, Matthew 5 and Luke 6 may be different accounts of the same sermon that the Savior gave. One of them is known in Matthew 5 as the Sermon on the Mount, and Luke 6 is also known as the Sermon on the Plain. It is possible that these are accounts of the same sermon, but it's also possible that they're accounts of similar sermons that the Savior may have given at different places and different times. During our highlight today, we'll be studying mostly from chapter 5 of Matthew, but at the end, we will go to something in Luke chapter 6 that's not included in Matthew chapter 5. Now, the Savior's Sermon on the Mount is shared with us in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, so we're only covering the first part of it today. We also have other versions of this sermon. One of them is found in 3 Nephi, when the Savior taught the same teachings to the Nephites. We also have another version in the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And there's a lot of Joseph Smith translation adjustments, particularly in chapter 7, but there are a few also in chapters 5 and 6, and we'll look at a few of them today. So let's dive into the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it's easy to see this in the Book of Mormon account of the sermon because it was given at the temple in Bountiful, but the Sermon on the Mount is a temple sermon. It gives us steps to take to move from the profane to the holy, which is exactly what the temple does for us. It's like holding up a spiritual mirror so that we can see where we stand in our journey of getting closer to God. The mountain in the Sermon on the Mount stands as a parallel to Mount Sinai. One, Mount Sinai represents the old law and a time of apostasy when the Israelites were choosing not to accept God's higher law. The other mount, the one in Matthew chapter 5, represents restoration and a new law or a higher law. One thing that the Savior does in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly in Matthew chapter 5, is to teach us about who he is. That's really what he's saying. This is who I am. Now, if our goal and purpose in this life is to eventually become like him, well, then we ought to pay attention to who he is and take note of these things so that we can become better at being more like him. And in this sermon, he reveals the secret to becoming like him. Matthew chapter 5 reflects the Lord's attempt to teach us his way. And we could see chapter 5 as a type of temple text. We could look at it in terms of God's temple, which is a path to take us from the profane or the natural man, our weakness, into strength and holiness and godliness. The temple is a place where we will learn of his ways and walk in his paths. And in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord teaches us his way. He starts with what we call the Beatitudes— Now, they don't have anything to do with attitudes at all. 
The name Beatitudes comes from a Latin word called beatus, which means to be blessed. The Savior began by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word translated in English as poor comes from a Greek word meaning begging. So if we look at this as our journey to godliness, we start off poor, poor in spirit. We lack the spirit of God. We need to become like him. And as we look at this same verse in 3 Nephi chapter 12, the Lord adds some words there. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now we can cross-reference this with Ether chapter 12, verse 27. Once again, in our journey from mortal weakness to godliness and perfection, we look at Ether chapter 12, verse 27, and it says, If men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Ultimately, our weakness is our mortality, and God is going to turn that weakness into perfection. By the end of this chapter, you'll notice at the very end of Matthew chapter 5, we get that verse, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven isn't perfect. That's our goal. That's where we're moving toward. So we start out first by being poor in spirit and coming unto God. Next, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, when you think of mourning, you might often think of sadness, but we could look at this as us mourning to have more of God's Spirit. You could look at it as a form of godly sorrow, and those who do mourn, those who do yearn for the Spirit, will be comforted. Now, remember, who is the comforter? What will the blessing be for those that mourn? The next verse says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A lot of people confuse the word meek to mean something like weak, but that's not the definition of meek at all. Christ was the perfect example of meekness, and Christ is not weak. I once heard a really good definition of meekness as perfect control of immense power. It's poise when you're under pressure. It's patience in the face of provocation. Once in a smaller setting, Elder David A. Bednar described meekness, and I'll just paraphrase his words. He said that meekness is often silent. Now, I think here about Jesus when he was appearing before Pontius Pilate. Pilate was accusing him, and he was on trial, but Christ was meek in that he had perfect control over himself. I highly recommend an intense study of the characteristic of meekness. Some great references for you would be the talk Meek and Lowly of Heart by Elder Bednar from April 2018 General Conference. Another one is by Elder Neil A. Maxwell, and his talk was called Meekness, a Dimension of True Discipleship. That's from March 1983 General Conference. And of course, Elder Maxwell's book Meek and Lowly is also a really great reference. If you would like to learn what meekness is and how to obtain that amazing Christ-like attribute. Now, as we move through the Beatitudes and get closer and closer to godliness, the next verse says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you think about what it means to really, really hunger or really thirst after something, I remember a talk from President Nelson from April 2017 called Drawing the Power of Jesus Christ into Our Life. He said these words in that talk, When you reach up for the Lord's power in your life with the same intensity that a drowning person has when grasping and gasping for air, power from Jesus Christ will be yours. When the Savior knows you truly want to reach up to Him, when he can feel that the greatest desire of your heart is to draw his power into your life, you will be led by the Holy Ghost to know exactly what you should do. I find that a great parallel to this verse in Matthew 5, verse number 6. When you're hungering and thirsting and yearning and really wanting righteousness as much as a drowning man wants air to breathe, then you'll be filled. And what will you be filled with? As President Nelson said, you'll be filled with the Spirit. 
He will give you his presence. He will give you his direction. He'll give you his comfort. You'll be blessed with his companionship. This is part of what it means to me to receive the Holy Ghost. It's to yearn for it, to want it so badly that everything you do shows the Lord that you want more than anything in this world to have him with you. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about what that's like, go and study 3 Nephi chapters 19 and 20. In fact, you might notice that after the Savior delivered this sermon to the Nephites in 3 Nephi 12, the chapters that follow were a realization of them actually traveling this path to becoming more like him. It's remarkable to see the realization of the Sermon on the Mount being lived in the chapters that follow it in 3 Nephi. The next verse in our study of Matthew 5 is verse number 7. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, receiving the Holy Ghost is a gift of God's mercy to us. And once we receive that mercy or that gift, He expects us to be merciful to others. The next verse says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In the temple, we know that we have the opportunity and promise that we will one day see God. The Greek word catharsis that was used as pure in this verse is more of a burning type of cleansing. So as we continue on in this path to become like God, he cleanses, he burns away the sin and dross from our soul and truly does sanctify both our body and our spirit. Remember in the sacrament, we bless the water and the bread to the sanctification of of the soul, which is both the body and the spirit. So when we're sanctified or pure in heart, it's a symbol of who a person is at their very core. It's not necessarily what people will see clearly on the outside, but what lies inside. The next verse is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When you can obtain enough Christ-like attributes to actually create peace, you can become the children of God. We're, we're becoming born again, as we talked about in a previous episode. Then blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, the only righteous one to ever walk the earth is Jesus Christ. So blessed are they which are persecuted for Christ's sake. And in verse 11, it's coupled with that verse. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Why does it emphasize twice in these both of these verses being persecuted? Not so much because we might be persecuted, but because we will. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. In April 2011, President Nelson said these words in General Conference, Why do we need such resilient faith? Because difficult days are ahead. Rarely in the future will it be easy or popular to be a faithful Latter-day Saint. Each of us will be tested. The Apostle Paul warned that in the latter days those who diligently follow the Lord shall suffer persecution. That very persecution can either crush you into silent weakness or motivate you to be more exemplary and more courageous in your daily lives, close quote. And I would add that when we do allow that persecution to drive us to become more courageous, we once again realize that we're poor in spirit and we need more of God's spirit with us. And so we find ourselves once again at the beginning of the Beatitudes where we are poor in spirit. And we go through this process iteratively over and over and over until we can become more blessed, more meek, thirst even more for righteousness. We become even more merciful to others. We become even more sanctified and pure in heart. We become peacemakers to a greater degree. And we continue along this path until ultimately, eventually, one day, we can become like He is. Perfect. In verse 12, the Lord said, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Heaven is not the greatest blessing. What you get there is the greatest blessing. That's exaltation, eternal family life. 
This is the difference between salvation and eternal life. Salvation is going to heaven. Eternal life is receiving a fullness of God's glory when you get there. To help us along that journey, in verse 13, the Lord said, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? In order to better understand this, we have to understand the characteristics of salt. Salt is used to flavor things, but it's also used to preserve things. In fact, at Jesus' time, they didn't have refrigerators, and so they used salt to preserve their food. If we are the salt of the earth, or at least if we're meant to be the salt of the earth, then what gives us our savor? What allows us to be different from the rest of the world? What allows us to have the ability to preserve the world? That could make for a great classroom or family discussion. One possible answer to that question is the fact that we walk God's path, not our own. And as we walk God's covenant path, we realize that what makes us different are the covenants that we commit to live. And the result of living those covenants is the power God gives us from himself to be able to overcome the world. So if walking God's path and keeping our covenants with him is what gives us our savor, then how do we make sure we never lose it? I'll leave that question with you to ponder. In the next verse, the Lord said, Ye are the light of the world. And then in verse 16, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's important to remember what light we are supposed to shine. In 2 Nephi 26.29, it says, He commandeth that there shall be no priestcrafts, For behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. Now, obviously, there are those in the world that try to build their own kingdom and draw all the attention to themselves and have no desire to build up God's kingdom or establish Zion. But among members of the church who do want to build up Zion, it's important for us to remember that we need not draw attention to ourselves along the way. When we share God's gospel or his love with others, we don't want to shine light on ourselves. Our own face, our name, you and I don't need to be highlighted in our service to him. The message we share is the message of the Son of God. It's his gospel. It is his message. And we should be pointing people not to us, but to him. Remember, the purpose of letting our light shine is to glorify our Father in heaven. And to glorify means to magnify or reveal or make known or clarify. Glorifying God is magnifying His character through our actions and through the righteous use of our agency. It's to praise and honor and exalt Him and not to increase the size of our bank account or the number of followers we have on our social media accounts. One of the great purposes of Christ's Sermon on the Mount was to establish his authority among the Jews. Most of the rabbis and those that would teach at the time would always refer back to the leading rabbis of the day. But Christ did not. He did mention some of the rabbis' teachings. For example, whenever he would say things like, Ye have heard it said of them of old. Sometimes he was referring to the law of Moses, and other times it seems he may have been referring to rabbinical teachings that were popular during his day. But he followed those up every time with his own law. Speaking with outright authority in himself, he would say things such as, Ye have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman, and I would add as other Holland has, or a man, to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The Lord raised the bar. He wasn't just building a fence around the law to prevent them from breaking the law. He was raising the bar. He was increasing the law. And by doing so, he was elevating the spiritual life of anyone who was willing to live his law. Once again, think of the temple. In fact, even going one step further, in verse 29, the Lord said, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. 
For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. In other words, if there is something in your life, if it's a phone or a computer or a friend, if there is something in your life that's preventing or slowing your spiritual progress and your relationship with God, get rid of it. Put it away. Break off your association with that thing or that person. It is better that you go through your life without a cell phone if you need to than for you to keep a cell phone and end up going to hell, as Christ said. And I would even add, rather than allowing your life to become a living hell here on earth, simply because you can't seem to part with the thing that's causing you the most spiritual struggle. There are so many more things that we could highlight in this chapter, but to keep these episodes more brief, let's skip to verse number 48. Be ye therefore perfect, the Savior said, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. President Russell M. Nelson gave a great talk called Perfection Pending in October 1995. Another remarkable talk about this topic was given by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland in October 2017. I want to cross-reference this verse with Moroni chapter 10 verse 32. In a way, Moroni 10 32 encapsulates much of what we read in Matthew chapter 5, and it also ends with the idea of becoming perfect. Listen closely. Yea, come unto Christ, and be perfected in Him. Deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you, that by His grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. Sometimes when we read Matthew 5.48 and the Savior's command to be ye therefore perfect, we might get overwhelmed. But as we read Moroni chapter 10 verse 32, we understand what Christ is saying when he says be ye perfect. You can't look at verse 48 by itself. But when you look at verse 48 in context with the rest of Matthew chapter 5, and Moroni 10.32 does just that, It becomes much easier to be filled with hope in Christ, to see that He's the way to our perfection, that we're not in this by ourselves. We don't have to be perfect today. We don't have to do it all. But Christ can help us step by step, incrementally and iteratively as we progress one day after another, one Christ-like attribute at a time, until He can help make us pure. The Sermon on the Mount really is a temple message. It's a message about approaching the presence of God, not just physically, but spiritually as well. Thanks for listening to this scripture highlight from Matthew 5 and Luke 6. I hope that you enjoyed it and found something that you could take away for a family discussion, a classroom conversation, or even just for your personal life. And I have good news. Christ's magnificent Sermon on the Mount isn't over. Next week, we get to study even more of that sermon in Matthew chapters 6 and 7. Have an excellent week, and no matter what you go through this week, I hope that you remember that there is always hope in Christ.